Hey guys, Tyler here. The Prime Directive is the non-interference policy of the Federation Starfleet in the Star Trek universe. Plainly, it prohibits Starfleet officers from interfering in the natural development and affairs of alien civilizations, no matter how well-intentioned. While Starfleet holds this ethical principle in the highest regard, as we see throughout the franchise, not every captain or Starfleet officer in general obeys it. A common misconception is that the Prime Directive only applies to societies that have not yet achieved warp drive, although this cutoff is often used to determine whether a species is ready for interstellar dialogue. And because officers are prohibited from playing God with inhabitants of pre-warp planets, a slavish adherence to the Prime Directive often entails letting disasters unfold, including an entire race's extinction via natural causes. The Prime Directive is highly controversial both in-universe and in Trek fan circles, with many considering its ethics not so cut and dry. In this video, I'd like to analyze Starfleet's number one rule and attempt to answer the question, is Star Trek's Prime Directive useless, even harmful? Let's find out. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Let me ask you a question. Does it make sense that one company controls 90% of internet searches, provides your email service, and can track everything you do on your smartphone? I didn't think so. And if you think that's invasive, what about the fact that internet service providers know every website you visit and can legally sell that information to advertisers and tech giants without your consent. That's where ExpressVPN comes in. When running ExpressVPN on your device, the software reroutes and encrypts all your traffic through their servers. It also hides your IP address, making it harder for tech giants to trace your activity and sell it to advertisers. ExpressVPN works on all devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. What I like most about ExpressVPN is that it's easy to use. Just download the app on your phone or computer Tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one VPN as rated by TechRadar, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like me and believe your online activity should stay private, go to expressvpn.com slash orange river or use the link in the description and find out how you can get an extra three months free. Now, back to the video. The Prime Directive has its origins in the spacefaring protocols of the Vulcans as early as the mid-20th century, as the Vulcans had, about 1600 years prior, experienced a devastating nuclear war that kept them from exploring the stars for over a millennium. They were obsessed with making sure that other species, such as humanity, didn't advance too fast. While the effects of this, in some ways, paternalistic attitude didn't come to bear until the mid-21st to mid-22nd centuries. This is why Vulcans did not make official first contact with Earth before 2063, when Zephram Cochran broke the warp barrier. Indeed, one can understand why the Vulcans waited this long. In the mid-19th century, we had barely invented electricity. And in the middle of the 20th century, we were engaged in a Cold War that, at times, threatened to annihilate our entire species with nukes. Not the kind of intellectual society that would be mature enough to handle itself on the interstellar stage, one could argue. And besides the cultural angle, the Vulcans undoubtedly saw the development of faster-than-light travel as a sign that, whether we were ready or not, interaction with other species was now inevitable case in point, their own contact with us. In the 2150s, as ships like the NX-01 explore the galaxy, we see the other seeds of what would become the Prime Directive. Two different episodes of Enterprise's first season, Civilization and Dear Doctor, deal with pre-warp societies that are suffering from deadly diseases. In the first one, the Enterprise crew discovers that the Malurians have been conducting a covert mining operation on the homeworld of the pre-warp Akali. An industrial lubricant has been leaking into the environment, 
causing many Akali to develop lesions, until Archer helps destroy the reactor and force the Malurian mining operator Garros to leave the planet. In the second, Archer has Phlox develop a cure for the Valachians, who are on the verge of natural extinction due to a genetic ailment. However, another, less developed species on Valachus, the Mink, are immune. Phlox believes the Mink have the potential to become the dominant species on Valachis, and wishes to let nature take its course, though Archer overrules this. He orders Phlox to provide the Valachians with a treatment that will ease symptoms, but Archer refuses to give the Valachians warp drive to help them search for a cure, effectively dooming them to extinction. Both of these episodes tackle issues related to the Prime Directive, though in different ways. In Civilization, the NX-01 crew agrees with T'Pol that it is preferable to hide their true identities to reduce cultural contamination. And a Akali named Rian ultimately figures out that aliens are walking among her people, agreeing to keep it a secret. But in Dear Doctor, the Valachians have already had contact with other alien species, so the NX-01 crew make no attempt to hide their true nature, as the contamination has already occurred. In Dear Doctor, Archer and Phlox both struggle over the ethics of intervention. In fact, the original script ended with Phlox secretly disobeying Archer's order to provide treatment. Archer's passionate unwillingness to refuse the Valachians' medical help is accompanied by his restraint in handing over warp technology. The Valachians have hardly even grasped the theoretical physics behind warp travel, and they have little experience handling antimatter. He understands how the Vulcans must have felt after first contact with humanity. A hundred years before Enterprise, humanity almost destroyed itself in a destructive Third World War. He posits that one day, Starfleet will develop a doctrine regarding such intervention. By 2259, the Prime Directive also known as Starfleet Command General Order 1, has been in place for decades. It has 47 suborders, though at a broad level, it prohibits self-identification of the mission, interferences with societal development, and references to interstellar civilization. It offers further guidance on matters such as sharing scientific knowledge, intervening in a planet's politics, intervening in civil wars, helping a society escape natural disasters, and more. It persists even into the 24th century, with Jean-Luc Picard calling it not just a set of rules, it is a philosophy, and a very correct one. We'll come back to this particular sentiment later in this video. Once again, while the Prime Directive applies primarily to pre-warp civilizations, it is not exclusive to them. For instance, when it is revealed that Klingon Chancellor Kimpek is slowly dying after being poisoned, he asks Picard to be the arbiter of succession. Picard initially refuses, and while he doesn't directly cite the Prime Directive, it's clear he intends to uphold its spirit of non-interference in another civilization's politics. But Kimpek convinces Picard that this Starfleet officer, eliminating his killer from contention for leadership of the High Council, will actually prevent a war with neighboring powers. Picard accepts this logic, a demonstration of the Prime Directive's flexibility dependent on the given situation. Indeed, it is Picard himself who, a few years before in the episode Justice, says, There can be no justice so long as laws are absolute. Even life itself is an exercise in exceptions. He says this as the crew bails out Wesley from being executed on Rubicon 3 for falling in a flower bed. Oh no! Oh please no! I'd say violating the Prime Directive in this instance is perfectly reasonable. This is one of practically countless instances of a Starfleet officer intervening in a society's natural development to serve what they view as the greater good at hand. Other examples, particularly ones where contamination can be repaired with varying risks to a society's natural development, include the episodes Bread and Circuses, A Piece of the Action, Patterns of Force, The Paradise Syndrome, Who Watches the Watchers, First Contact, Homeward, Thine Own Self, 
and several more. Sometimes a society will send a general distress call as in Miri or Pen Pals. If a society hails or attacks a Federation vessel, such as in the Corbomite maneuver, they generally become exempt. If they're interfered with by another alien society, like the Klingons in A Private Little War, Caretaker in Caretaker, or the Ferengi in False Prophets, that's an exemption too. If they're in diplomatic discussions with the Federation, like the Bandy in Encounter at Farpoint, so too are they, you get the point. Notably, the Prime Directive does not apply to average Federation citizens, and Starfleet crews are forbidden from removing them even if they have materially interfered with its culture, such as in Angel One. Sometimes the Prime Directive is suspended in its entirety, such as in the Omega Directive, a general order requiring Starfleet captains to use any and all force to destroy Omega Molecules, which harm subspace and render warp travel impossible if destabilized. As a matter of security, only captains and flag officers are privy to knowledge of the Omega Directive and receive training to deal with such situations. This outweighs any philosophical aspirations of the Prime Directive due to the threat that Omega Molecules pose to interstellar civilization. There's also General Order 24, which permits a captain to, in highly specific circumstances, destroy an inhabited planet's entire surface and eradicate any societies living there. Okay, okay. Given the implications of Starfleet vessels possessing such a capability, it's probably time that we talk more about the ethics of the Prime Directive. The Prime Directive is not a matter of degrees. It is an absolute. As I've alluded to, the nuances inherent in the Prime Directive often leave its applications up to interpretation, left up to the discretion of individual Starfleet captains. As we see in the original series, James T. Kirk, for example, states that the Prime Directive is intended to apply to living, growing civilizations, and believes it is appropriate to interfere when a society has become stagnant, is enslaved, or is even in mortal danger. Notable examples include the inhabitants of Beta 3 and Gamma Trianguli 6, both of whom worship godlike machine intelligences. And of course, there's Kelvin Timeline Kirk's actions to save the inhabitants of Nibiru from succumbing to a volcanic eruption in Star Trek Into Darkness. Such examples naturally lead to intense discussions, even arguments, as to whether or not a particular crew is making the right choice. The situation in Pen Pals is, in my opinion, one of the best examples in early TNG of just how close the Prime Directive comes to forcing captains to let an entire civilization go extinct. After Data receives a transmission from a young girl on a pre-warp planet, he establishes communication with the girl invariably proving the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations. Her transmission requests aid for her planet as it has fallen victim to geologic instability, but the crew are divided on how to address this problem. Picard's often slavish devotion to non-interference, even in the face of natural disaster, is perfectly showcased here. But ultimately, he agrees that it would be a mistake to simply stand by, especially since the contamination has already occurred. After the crew saves her planet, Pulaski erases the girl's memories of her contact with Data. A job well done. Okay, this is all good and well, but What's with the riders forcing these Starfleet crews all the time to agonize over whether to stop a genocide? All right, letting a volcanic eruption wipe out a civilization may not be genocide per se, but in a way, isn't it? Starfleet's General Order 1 explicitly prohibits captains from intervening in many situations in which a society is in danger of perishing. Whether it's a natural disaster or a disease or a war, they're told, don't interfere, don't play God. But it's the classic bystander dilemma. Isn't non-interference a form of interference in and of itself? By not taking action to prevent a tragedy, are you not complicit in such an act? If a Starfleet vessel orbiting a planet does not use the tools at its disposal to save a species from dying, that's the Federation effectively saying they didn't deserve to exist. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. At this point, 
after decades of fan discussion around this topic, Picard has become something of a meme for this very reason. His willingness to do what a non-Federation citizen, or even perhaps an average Federation citizen, believes is the right thing to do. Just because a rule's a rule. Many say that Kirk knew when to bend the rules, a point in his favor in the never-ending argument over who's the best captain. But let's not be so hard on Picard for a moment. Does he, in fact, truly know what he's doing? Was Kirk actually more reckless than he should have been? Catherine Janeway thinks so, citing in the episode Flashback how 23rd century Starfleet officers were rougher around the edges, though she does admit that she would have loved to ride shotgun gun with a group of officers like that. When it comes to our modern civilization, there is an argument to be made that intervening in the affairs of other societies should be discouraged. At its worst, such intervention can lead to bloody conflicts like the Vietnam War or the various wars in the Middle East. Intervention by the likes of the United States and, historically, the Soviet Union and British Empire, among others, caused, undeniably, I should stress, more pain and suffering than if they had just left various societies alone. Carrying this example further, when the United States ended its 20-year occupation of Afghanistan, the Taliban made enormous, rapid gains immediately thereafter. This has had the atrocious effect of reversing progress made in areas like women's education, but advocates of the withdrawal argue that, unfortunately, the Taliban taking over was inevitable whether the U.S. pulled out in 2011, 2021, or 2041. The sad truth is, not every society on this earth regards equality in the same way. The victory of Islamist forces in the Iranian Revolution, the arrests of stadium patrons wearing pride shirts in Qatar during the 2022 World Cup. Academically, one must consider that if you view gender equality, for example, as progress, which you you should, there's definitely a spectrum inherent to humanity. Some societies progress during periods of liberalization, even secularization, while others regress, regress. You, you know what I'm trying to say. Even in the context of technological prowess, such as the European Dark Ages after the fall of the Western Roman Empire until the Renaissance. Questions remain as to how fast globalization will encourage every nation to adopt the same standards for human rights as the admittedly self-appointed standard bearers, such as the founding members of the United Nations, who themselves are also, you know, kind of hypocritical on human rights in many instances. But regardless, is it truly wise to interfere, whether militarily or just even diplomatically, in the affairs of a society until the citizens living there have decided for themselves that they want to conduct their nation in accordance with liberal values? Non-interventionists would argue, no, you should let other societies evolve on their own. It's this kind of thinking the kind that advocated U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam in the 1960s that led to the formation of the Prime Directive during the run of Star Trek The Original Series. The YouTube channel Trexpertise, who are a big inspiration of mine, recently uploaded a video of their own about the Prime Directive. It would be foolish to deny that that video was highly controversial. I encourage you all to go watch that video in full. Like everything that Trex Pertice does, it is very well produced, and it offers measured, thoughtful arguments about the ethics of the Prime Directive, like I'm trying to do right now. In a nutshell, Trex Pertice's video levies that the Prime Directive, while perhaps well-intentioned at the outset, is racist, a holdover from antiquated colonialist thinking. Trexpertise takes issue with the hard cutoff of pre-warp and warp capable that defines a society's fitness for contact in Star Trek. The video cites how the Inca were able to build one of the greatest empires this planet has ever seen. Without the use of the wheel, 
or for that matter, draft animals, knowledge of iron or steel, or any system of writing. So too did the Aztecs build a great empire, with their most populous city, Tenochtitlan, having possessed military dominance over central Mexico without having invented gunpowder. The Spanish conquistadors under Hernán Cortés only defeated the Aztecs with the help of native allies who were the Aztecs' enemies. The gist is, what one society, such as those descended from the empires of Europe, might consider technologically advanced isn't necessarily the objective truth. The Trexpertise video uses this line of logic to argue that the application of the Prime Directive by Starfleet to determine which alien civilizations are and aren't ready for contact is, again, racist. This is because determinations about the relative advancement of non-European cultures have been used to justify the bigotries of scientific racism as well as outright eugenics. Presenter Kyle Sullivan even opines that new Trek, like Strange New Worlds, doesn't do much better to lay this antiquated philosophy of advancement to rest. But as this video of mine is already tending towards the long side, I feel the need to step in and draw my own conclusions in the hopes of encouraging you to do the same. Do I think that the Prime Directive is racist? Moreover, do I think that it's useless or even harmful as applied in Star Trek? Let's answer these one at a time. As to the question of racism, it's complicated. It is true that defining alien societies as savage or civilized, as it were, is often the byproduct of racism. But can we not call out savagery where it actually exists? The treatment of women, LGBT people, and religious and racial minorities in societies across the world easily qualifies as discriminatory, if not outright savage and backwards in my view. Because I see no moral reason that such inequality should exist under the law. But I also think that political and military leaders should leave the citizens of other countries to come to that conclusion on their own. With some exceptions, of course. For example, stopping the spread of Nazism in Europe in World War II is widely regarded as having been a correct and moral intervention. But then again, as I've said, intervention can lead to unimaginable death and suffering, like the atomic bombs the US dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Unjustifiably, I should add. So, it's complicated. To the question of whether the Prime Directive makes sense or is moral in Star Trek, well, that's also complicated. It depends on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't fully agree with Trexpertise that warp drive is a useless metric for first contact, as pre-warp societies are by definition more hard-pressed to meaningfully engage in interstellar affairs. For example, I think that Earth in real life is probably not ready for contact with an alien civilization. Indeed, I would imagine there's a consensus among humans in the 23rd and 24th century that the Vulcans' role in limiting human expansion prior to the mid-22nd century was at least understandable. There's a fine line between the human drive to explore and our drive to conquer. That's why the Terran Empire feels so familiar to us, that it's likelier to be our future than the Federation future. But a society that has some level of technological and cultural sophistication, yet for whatever reason hasn't broken the specific barrier of faster than light travel, perhaps need not be doomed to die alone in the dark just to make some Starfleet admirals feel good about themselves. Again, nuance is key. If it were up to me, I'd keep the warp barrier as the primary cutoff for first contact. Because without it, interstellar trade is nigh impossible. But I'd also allow exceptions to that rule where they make sense. Furthermore, I'd dispense with this nonsense about how saving a civilization from extinction is somehow morally unjustifiable. One could look at it as redemption for all the extinctions we've caused on Earth in real life. So, do I think that the Prime Directive is useless? No, I don't think so. I just think it needs to be softened up a little bit. A couple more things before I go. 
a society's natural development will almost certainly look different from planet to planet, from civilization to civilization, even taking into account the vast majority of Star Trek aliens we meet on screen are descended from the genetic code of the ancient humanoid progenitors, I hardly see why that should mean they would all evolve industrially along the same lines as Earth has on aggregate. So perhaps when it comes to the countless times that Starfleet officers have taken application of the Prime Directive into their own hands, they should be given some more slack. Also, do you think that hypothetical alien civilizations civilizations in real life are exercising a form of the Prime Directive right now, if extraterrestrial intelligence is as common as it is in the Star Trek universe, that is, probably tens of thousands of alien races in the Milky Way alone, then undeniably they must be, otherwise we probably would have been contacted already. Even if intelligent life is rare, perhaps a few dozen or a few hundred civilizations in the galaxy, more likely in my opinion. I still think the same applies, even if civilizations are more spread apart and have fewer opportunities for two-way communication, I still think that most alien races that can travel the galaxy will be peaceful. I think it's humans who run the risk of becoming the colonizers, as it were, on other planets, but perhaps that's a story for another time. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it that stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. <laughs>